Okay, so now we're going to pick up the mean and standard deviation formulas for a binomial random variable. So the mean value, sometimes called the expected value, and the standard deviation of a binomial random variable are these two formulas respectively. All right, so the mean will be n times p, and the standard deviation will be the square root of np times 1 minus p, All right, where p is the constant probability that any particular trial results in a success. And if you think you might have trouble remembering these, don't fret, they're on that trait table. So if you realize that you're in a binomial experiment and you're in this column, right, you can see the mean, there's the formula for it, np. Standard deviation, right there. Square root np, 1 minus p. So I've got you covered if you start realizing how you want to use this trait table to your benefit. So let's look at a problem and see if we can figure out the mean of this random variable. So a survey asks a random sample of 1,500 adults in Ohio if they support an increase in the state sales tax with the additional revenue going to education. Let x denote the number in the sample that say they support the increase. Suppose 40% of all adults in Ohio support the increase. The average of x is. So where I wanna, what I wanna point out it's always our standard, what was the variable in this problem? And it's, it's spelled out for you here, right? It says, let x denote the number in the sample that say they support the increase. So there's my variable. All right, now when we think of the number in the sample that support the increase, am I gonna count the number who support the increase or am I gonna measure it? I'm definitely gonna count it. So this is a discrete numerical variable. All right, so it's a discrete numerical variable. And again, I had a sample of 1,500. So I want us to start to think about the sample space here. All right, what values could X take on? Well, it's possible, not necessarily probable, but it's possible nobody in that 1,500 supports the increase. It's possible one person does, two people do, all the way up to, so I'll go comma, dot, 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 all the way up to 1,500. All right, the sample space is somewhere in there. Now I want you to think, if I had been asking you to make a table, right, that table would be ridiculously long. Right? It's stupid long. There's no way I'm actually asking you to construct that table and then find the average using one bar stats L1, L2. It's binomial. But we, we struggle sometimes in forgetting to check that it's binomial. So I'll say it as many times as I need. When it comes to making tables, if there's too many columns that are going to be in there, and in this case there will be 1,502 columns in our table, that's way too many, then go to this part, right? Go to this column and check the four properties to see if it's binomial. So let's, let's test that theory out. Let's figure out, is this thing binomial or not? So let's start with the first property. Do I have a fixed number of trials? Yeah, I have 1,500 people that I'm gonna to talk to. Okay, great. So I'm through the first property. Let's think about the second property, right? Do I have something I can call a success? And again, success in quotes, it changes for each problem, but you see, it says here we wanna count the people who support increase. All right, are trials independent of one another? Well, if I'm talking to 1,500 folks at random, it shouldn't be the case where one person's opinion affects the next person's opinion, all right? As long as we're not talking to like a family or friends or people close to a certain um, candidate or something to that effect, then this should be a, ver or a case where the trials are independent. And they tell us here that the probability of success, right, is 40%. So as I go through this, I see it's binomial. So instead of making the table, I get to just do this. I get to say, hey, my variable is distributed binomially. I had 1,500 trials, and the probability of success for any one trial was 40%. OK, so now it's asking you for the mean of x. I'm not asking you to calculate a probability, so no binomial PDF or CDF. But if we look at this, right, if I'm in the binomial column and the mean row, we can see I'm going to use this formula, n times p. So I know that the mean is going to be n times p. And in this problem, my n was 1,500, and my p was 
All right, so let's see what we got going on here. We go 1500 times 0.4, we get the number 600. Okay. And then 600 what? What are the units here? All right, 600 um, dollars, 600 um, percent in state tax. No, this is 600 people, right? And if we just take a step back, if 40% of Ohio folks support the bill, I expect 40% of my sample, right? So not quite half, half would be 750, a little bit lower than that, right? So 600 people. If I'm talking to 1,500 people, I expect to see that 600 support it. And when we look at the options here, right? I'm not asking about relative frequencies. 40 is way too low and D is my answer. So that's how we can use the formula for the binomial mean. And just just because, all right, even though we didn't we weren't asked to do it, if I needed to calculate the standard deviation, I would take the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. And I'm getting the 0.6 because the complement to 40% is 60%. Or another way of thinking about that is it, this is if 40% of adults support the increase, then 60% don't support the increase. And so there would have been my standard deviation, a standard deviation of close to 19 people. And if you didn't like me going through the um, 0.4 to 0.6, you could also have put parentheses and written 1 minus 0.4 in here. That's totally fine. It's just going to take a little longer to type out. But if that makes more sense in your head, go for it. Okay. So let's look at a free response question. Okay, and I wanna to talk to you about guessing on a multiple choice exam. So I'm sure at some point in your, your educational careers you've had an all multiple choice exam. So I wanna to talk to you about the likelihood that if you straight up guessed, you guessed on every single problem in this 100 point or 100 question exam, what's the likelihood that you would pass? All right, so let's see, how likely is it that if, you, if you're not doing any studying and you're just straight up gonna bubble through your multiple choice test, what's the likelihood that you would pass? So here we go. You are taking a multiple choice exam consisting of 100 questions with five possible responses to each question. Suppose that you have not studied and so must guess, so you're gonna select one of the five in a completely random fashion. So you, suppose you have not studied and so you must guess on each question. Let x represent the number of correct responses on that test. So here we go, I can see it, right? There's my variable, the number of correct responses on the test. So let's see if we can figure this out. All right, if I'm taking a test, am I gonna count the number of correct responses I got or measure? And I'm definitely gonna count it. So this is discrete, plus we're still in chapter four, so every variable is numerical discrete. What values can X take on? Well, imagine you were taking a 100 question test. So what could I take on? I could get zero right, I could get one right, I could get two, all the way up to 100, right? Those, that's my sample space. All right, and we'll start to see not necessarily what's possible, but what is probable in a moment, but this is what's possible. So you can imagine if if this wasn't binomial, and we're gonna answer that question in part C, but if it wasn't binomial and I had to make a table, you would have to have 102 columns in that table. And think of the tree diagram that would um, require. It's awful to think about, and it's just not worth our time. It's gonna be binomial, but let's check those four properties. All right, so as I go through this, do I have a fixed number of trials? I sure do. There are 100 questions in here, okay? Is there something I can deem a success? Yep. I can have a correct answer. Are trials independent? They sure are. If I'm just guessing, all right, if I, if I were to happen to guess correctly on number two, that has no bearing on whether or not I will correctly guess number three because I'm just guessing at random. All right, now the fun one is what's the probability of success? It's written in here, but it's a little subtle. Right, they tell you here that there are five possible answers. So you would think of, of it as, I could have A, B, C, D, or E. And you are gonna select one of the five, and one of those five is correct, so our probability of success is one out of five. Or if you crunch that on your calculator, you have about 20%, okay? So, I got through all four of these, fantastic. 
So instead of making a table, I'm going to say my variable x, the number of correct responses, is distributed, that's what the squiggle means, binomially, and we had, what, 100 questions with a 1 in 5 chance of getting any one question correct. All right, so it's binomial. Once it's binomial, I get all of this stuff at my disposal. Right? I'm going to stay in this column. All right, so let's start answering these questions. It says, what is your expected score? Expected is another word for mean. So in terms of my mean, it would be n times p. So that would be, in this case, 100 times 20. Okay. And if we do 100 times 0.2, we're going to get about 20 questions correct. So 20 questions answered correctly. And just as a side note, if you've ever taken a standardized test and they say something to you like, I'll subtract a quarter point off for each incorrect guess, right? So they, they do that to encourage you to not guess. So if you've had that before, I just want to explain why. It's, it's actually not, um, it's, it's totally um, scientific and binomially related as to why they do that. So what they're betting on is if you were to just guess on 100 points, a 100 question quiz, that you would just by chance, you'd get some right, and we think it would be about 20. But are you also with me that if you get 20 right, it's implied that you get 80 incorrect? So if you get 20 points just through guessing, the reason they subtract out a quarter of a point is if you take, let me do it this way, if you take 80 questions and you lose a quarter of a point, for each question, you're going to lose 20 points. So what that means, if I think of it a different way, you get the 20 points just because you guessed correctly, and they're going to penalize you for the 80 you guessed incorrectly by taking off a quarter of a point. Right? So a quarter of a point, 0.25, and that brings your score back down to zero. So that's why they subtract the quarter of a point off from those standardized tests for guessing, because they, they realize mathematically, on average, it will set your score back to zero. All right, so the, the 20 you get just by chance gets negated by the 80 you get wrong, also by chance, okay? So that's why when you have a multiple choice question, or multiple choice um, test, if you have five answers, if you can narrow it down to only three options, like you can rule two out, then it's in your favor to guess, and if you can't rule it out, it's in your favor to leave it blank. And again, this is only for those types of tests that penalize you for guessing wrong. Not every standardized test does that. All right, so the next question on here says, hey, get me the variance and the standard deviation. So let's think about standard deviation and then we'll work ourselves back up to variance. So for standard deviation, I have this formula, square root NP, one minus P. So let me start with that. And then we'll talk about how you get the variance. So the standard deviation is the square root of NP1 minus P. So in this case, it's the square root of 100 times 0 0.2, <coughs> excuse me, times 1 minus 0 0.2. And let's see what that number is equal to. So I will do the square root of 100 times 0 0.2 times 1 minus 0 0.2, and I will get 4. Now, what are the units on this? Well, the units on this are the same as the units of your variable, right? Every statistic has the same units of your variable, so this is four correct answers. All right, so on average, somebody's going to get 20 correct just by guessing, and they will deviate from that on an, by an average of about four. Now, if we remember from Chapter 2, the relationship between standard deviation and variance, all right, in order to get from standard deviation up to variance, variance was always the larger number, square the standard deviation. So I'm going to take the square of this expression, and if you remember from your math days, when you square root, or if, excuse me, if you square something that is already square rooted, it just goes away. All right, so everything under that radical is the variance, or we would call it the radicand, if you want to sound fancy. But this is 100 times 0.2 times 1 minus 0.2. So if I put that in my calculator, you see I'm going to get 16. 
And maybe you saw already that the faster way to do it is once you have the standard deviation, just square that number to get the variance. Because what is 4 squared? It is 16. All right. So this is 16. Now the units on this are nonsense. Um, so the units on variance are the square of the units of your variable. All right, but they make no sense in the real world. All right, so 16 correct, let me write answers, squared. I mean, this makes no sense. I don't even know what that means in the context of the real world. And keep in mind that the variance, before we had these calculators and these nice formulas, the variance was literally a means to an end, where the end end game here was getting the standard deviation. So don't worry so much about the units on variance because ultimately we just square root that number and get the standard deviation. All right, so I just want us to think about before we get to F, right? If I'm thinking of my sample space of zero to 100, right? Most people are getting around 20. And even if you go a standard deviation in either direction, we go 24 to 16, right? So most folks are in there. Maybe we could go one standard deviation further in either direction, 12 to 28. You can see that if you're just guessing, it's gonna be really hard to get anything over 30, right? I mean, most of us are gonna be in this 12 to 28 band just by guessing. So with that, let's start to think about how likely would it be if I was actually gonna try and pass this test just through guessing. All right, so let me move this up. So here we go. So based on your answers in part D and E, is it likely, right? Is it probable that you would score 70 or higher, i.e. would you pass the test and let's show a calculation. So we were just saying that most folks are gonna score in between 12 and 28. So how likely is it that just by chance you score 70 or higher? All right, now if I wanna go 70 or higher, right? That is the probability, because I have this likely, that X is greater than or equal to 70. Now, because this is binomial, I can use binomial PDF and CDF for this. So let's think about greater than or equal to. All right, and we're gonna go back to this table. Now, when it says less than or equal to, it says use binomial CDF, but for greater than or equal to, use the complement rule. All right, so I'm gonna use the complement rule with the binomial probability. So here we go. We're gonna do one minus the probability, and then I gotta figure out less than or equal to here. And the, the question's gonna come in, do you put the 70 here? Do you put 71 or 69? So let me put them in order. Do you put 69, 70, or 71? And let's think about what we want. So I'm going zero to 100, and let me put the numbers pretty close to 70. So we'll put 70 itself, 71, and 69, okay? I want 70 or higher. So I wanna include this number, I wanna include this number, I want to include all the numbers up to 100, right? I want to include these numbers, which means I want to exclude these numbers. So if I want 70 or higher, I do not want 69 on down. And your calculator is built on down. So the number we want to put in here is 69, all right? So again, if I want 70 or higher, I do not want 69 on down. So now I can just go run binomial CDF and let's see, we had, what, 100 trials, 20% chance of success, and I'm plugging in 69, right? And this is, again, the likelihood that you would pass just through guessing. So here we go. Let's do one minus binomial CDF. All right, we had 100 questions, 20% chance of success on any one trial, 69, and then there you go. So what is the likelihood? that you will pass this test just through guessing, you won't. It's it just straight up saying, you're not gonna pass, you better be studying. All right, so you would get zero. All right, so is it likely that you would score higher than 70? No, it is very unlikely. No, very unlikely. All right, I mean, in fact, it's just straight up saying, it'll never happen. All right, we got one more problem and then we're gonna close out chapter four. I'll see you in a bit, bye.